കരുവാൻ സരനായി മേ ദ ബ്ലെസ്സിങ്സ് ഓഫ് ദ നോബൽ ട്രിപ്പിൾ ജിം ബി വിത്ത് യു ഓൾ ഡോക്ടർ ജാക്ക് കോൺഫീൽഡ് ദ ടു മോഡറേറ്റേഴ്സ് ടിയാറ ആൻഡ് സനാറ ദമ്മ സീക്കേഴ്സ് ഫ്രോം ശ്രീലങ്ക ആൻഡ് അക്രോസ് ദ വേൾഡ് it is my honor to welcome you all to the third of a series of intergenerational dialogues entitled a string of pearls vishwa niketan international peace center of sri lanka has organized this program to felicitate dr atr ratna who will be celebrating his 90th birthday on 5th november 2021 Dr. Ari founded the Sarvodaya movement 62 years ago in 1958 and uh, founded Vishwaniketan 20 odd years ago in 1994. Vishwaniketan dedicates this series of dialogues to Dr. A.T. Ari Ratna as an expression of gratitude for his lifetime of service to humanity. Simultaneously, Vishwaniketan sincerely intends to inspire the present and future generations to contribute towards the well-being of all life on earth, humans, animals, and the plant world. Today, we are celebrating the Vesa Full Moon Day, the birth, enlightenment, and passing away of the Buddha. It is truly a blessing to have world renowned dr jack confield as the speaker for a string of pearls the third event in our series of intergenerational dialogues dr jack confield has been a great friend of dr ati ari ratna for a long time who truly admires dr ari and his lifetime service although dr jack confield does not need any introduction I believe I would be failing in my duty if I don't introduce Dr. Cornfield officially to all our Dhamma friends in Sri Lanka and from across the world. Dr. Cornfield holds a PhD in clinical psychology, has trained as a Buddhist monk in the monasteries of Thailand, India and Burma and is one of the key teachers to introduce mindfulness to the west a founding teacher of the insight meditation society in bare massachusetts spirit rock uh, center in california he has taught meditation internationally since 1974 his books have been translated into 20 languages and sold more than million copies His 16 books include A Path with Heart, A Lamp in the Darkness, After the Ecstasy, The Laundry, The Wise Heart, A Guide to the Universal Teachings of Buddhist Psychology. Now I would like to introduce our two moderators, Tiara Ganegama and Sanara De Silva. Tiara and Sanara were two of the first few children to join Vishwaniketan's 3S, Searching the Self, Serving Society, Saving the Environment, Mini Spiritual Retreat for Kids, uh, which commenced in 2010. They have already begun their own journey of serving a purpose larger than their own lives, raising their voices to promote peaceful coexistence of not only human beings, but all life on earth due to the covid 19 third wave in sri lanka we are unable to host this event at the vishwaniketan premises but we are very glad that we can still connect from our personal spaces to bring this precious message of wisdom right to your homes with these introductory remarks i would like to invite Tiara and Sanara to commence the dialogue with Jack uh, Confield on the theme contentment and letting go. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tiara. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaika. And uh, 
Very, we're so glad to have you here with us, Dr. Confield. It's definitely an honor to sort of get to know you. And we're looking forward to learning more about your insight on the topic, contentment and letting go. I hope you're keeping well. Yes, very well, thank you. Oh, that's uh, great to hear. Amid all the things happening in the world, this is one of the things that's actually difficult for us to hold because even if we're feeling well, we also, because we're connected to everyone else, it's almost as if to say, I'm not so well because so many others that I love are also struggling. So, and I'm sure you as, you know, sensitive young people that you are, know this very thing, that our connection means we can say we are well, and at the same time in our heart, bring the others that we care about. Um, and uh, so we're not quite so well because of that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really sad to see so many people sort of go, go through what they're going through um, due to the pandemic and our, definitely our thoughts and our hearts are out with them. Um, so how do you feel like getting involved uh, in this dialogue today with us and it being a significant day here in Sri Lanka, um, the Vesak Full Moon Poya Day and Sri Lanka being one of the key holders of Theravada Buddhism? It's a very significant day here today. It, it is, and these kind of ritual days and holy days are most important because they remind us of something that's possible. Often we go through our day, I do, you do, doing our tasks, you know, and for you it might be in school, for me it's the teaching or writing or whatever I do. Um, and a day like Vesak lets us stop and pause, which we all need, and listen and be reminded, oh yes, there is a possibility of freedom of heart, of the great heart of compassion that the Buddha awakened in himself. And that, that's possible for all of us. And for us to take a breath and pause and stop, make some prayers, uh, meditate, simply remind ourselves that there's something beautiful that's been handed down from one generation to another, and that is your birthright, it's, it's your inheritance, that you too, uh, as young people, now have this gift of being reminded of this freedom that's possible in you, uh, wherever you are. So uh, it's a very, it's an auspicious day, and it's a beautiful thing for the generations to come together as, as you're creating here. So it makes me very happy. Thank you, Doctor, for your valuable words. So we'll dive right into the first question for today. Uh, we are celebrating Vesak for the second time during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the COVID-19 virus has actually challenged our humanity, the existence of human life on Earth. And here in Sri Lanka, we are going through our third wave. Um, and when we stepped in, to the 21st century, we humans thought that we had control over everything under the sun. But we cannot think of a more opportune time to speak about contentment and letting go. I would like to know your understanding of contentment and letting go in the context of the COVID-19 virus. Well, first, I listened to your question and um, I really want to answer from the heart because it's a deep question. Um, and a thoughtful question. And it's not something that, um, that words almost can touch because what's also true is that, again, while we may be safe in some way, we who really are part of our, woven in our community um, are going through so much. Um, the first thing that I wanna say to you as the next generations is, that we know how to do this. That every generation or two, humanity has had to face typhoons and earthquakes and floods and pandemics. It's not a new thing. Um, and we have learned somehow, not only to survive, but we've done so in part through loving and caring for each other. So this isn't a new thing. 
um, it's a very painful and difficult time. And in it, we have to watch and tend and be with people that we care about who are sick and hear other stories. Um, so it weighs on our heart. But at the same time, I think you all, as young people especially, need to know that this is something that we as humanity have not only survived over centuries and millennium, but that we know how to do this. We know how to rise when things are difficult. And instead of having it overwhelm us completely, to look inside for the deepest resources of the heart and say, let me be someone in the face of this that carries goodness and care and compassion to do what I can, whether it's to feed people or tend or, or even just send your love and goodwill and to know that you're part of something of, of generations and generations of people who love and care for one another. And this in some way seems to be part of the message that we've needed to get from COVID. Because in the modern times, it's really easy um, for people to get lo lost in a kind of individual identity. I will succeed, whether it's in school or, you know, in business or building a family or whatever it happens to be. Um, and now we really need to stop and pause and know, sense how much we need one another and that we have the inner resources. And those resources include the resource, resources of compassion, of mindfulness, of steadiness of heart. And that's actually what brings the kind of calm or steadiness you talked about in your question. And Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a friend of your grandfather, Ari, and another one of the great peace leaders in the world, said that when the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person on the boat remained steady and calm, it was enough. It showed the way for everyone else to survive. And so then the question is, who's that one person? And it turns out, of course, you know the answer, that it's you and you and me, that we become that person even in the difficulty to bear witness to the suffering, but to know that the suffering is not the end of the story. There is suffering, but there is also the great compassion and love and connection that's born of it where we care for one another. And this, I think, really says, how do we tend our hearts in these difficult times? That's the question you're asking. And it is through meditation and compassion and love. But even with that, remembering that we carry in us that you carry this, the, the, the possibility of the, the great heart of a Buddha saying you too can be carrying liberation. You too can live this. I don't know if this answered your question uh, exactly, uh, but at least it talks a little bit around the territory of it. Yes, it definitely did. I think COVID sort of put everything into perspective and it really grounded us as sort of human beings. And I think all material wealth that we sort of decided to gather around us seemed really nothing. And we tend to sort of extend our compassion and kindness out to everyone. And that's what really mattered at the end of the day. It sort of strengthened our bonds amongst each other as humans. So thank you, Doctor, for your words. Um, well, I so want to continue because the last thing I was thinking is, I have to ask you two, what have you learned? And you just told me something that's so beautiful and deep. Let me ask also, you know, Sanara, what, what have you learned in this? I think that uh, more than ever now, people are more human. We understand that, you know, the value of life, because before the pandemic hit us, we never really cared much about it. But now that we see that people, humans like us are dying every day, every minute, actually, we have a, a deeper connection emotionally, not only with humans, but also with the entire world. When you see um, 
not only the virus, you see wildfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, and deforestation, all that. People have had a certain amount of humanity planted within them. And now that seed is slowly growing into a beautiful tree. Um, and I feel that that really, this pandemic brought out our humanity more than ever. It makes me, uh, it gives me a great deal of delight to hear your understanding, both of yours and your wisdom. Um, it's as if um, there's an image of, of the lamp of, of awakening being passed from one generation to another so that it's carried. Um, and it's beautiful to hear you both carrying that lamp and your wisdom. Thank you. Now I'm, now I'm really happy. <laughs> and it's amazing to try to be happy in the middle of all of this, because that's also possible that even amidst the difficulty, um, here's a passage that I love from, from the Dhammapada, where the Buddha says, live in joy, in love, even among those who hate. Live in joy, in health, even among the afflicted. Live in joy, in peace, even among the troubled. Look within, be still, quiet the mind and heart, free from fears and attachments. Know the sweet joy of living in the way, of living in the Dharma. And so there's a way in which what you say uh, is that even in the difficulties, there's an awakening of compassion and connection that we've needed in this world so desperately. And I thank you for giving voice to it. You're most welcome, Doctor. And I think maybe growing up with sort of Sarvodaya from a very young age, it sort of, um, you know, put us into like, we we saw a lot of things and seeing our grandfather, we wanted to sort of follow his footsteps and sort of create change in the communities we're from. So it means a lot to hear that from you. Um, so the next question we had was, in today's world, people pursue happiness by trying to satisfy their five senses and by acquiring material wealth. And we're made to believe that if you are to experience happiness, that you have to acquire wealth. But we know that uh, we know people who have acquired like abundance wealth aren't really the happiest people on the planet. And the Buddha said in the text Dhammapada, contentment is the greatest wealth. We would like to know the difference between happiness and contentment in terms of the Buddha's teachings. So this is also a very deep question. Um, and one of the things that's beautiful about the teachings of the Buddha is that he clarifies what happiness is about. Um, there is the happiness, and he even the Buddha acknowledges there's the happiness of sense pleasures. If you have a good sweet, and you happen to like sweets, as I do, um, it lights up your tongue and you go, oh, this is a wonderful dessert. But you also know that if you ate that sweet all the time and nothing else, after a while you'd get sick of it, <laughs> no, matter, no matter what you like, if you had to keep eating it, because things change in that way. And you know somehow that that's not enough, that there's something more than that, that who we are is more than the pleasure uh, that we get of the senses. And so when the Buddha spoke of happiness, he said three of the great the great sources of happiness. Uh, one is generosity, that part of what makes us happy as human beings um, is to be able to care for one another. Um, and, and we know this, you know, if you think about it yourself, when you've had those moments where your friend was in trouble or somebody you care about, and you're able to reach out and make a difference and help them or soothe them or in some way um, through your care and your generosity uplift them there's something that it does to the heart says the buddha that makes you happier than all the great meals and you know all the sense things you could have 
because it touches a deeper place in you. And then he goes on to say, not just Dana, but Sila, 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 which is, as we know, is acting with integrity, virtue, that this brings happiness. Um, and the happiness that comes from it is that we, we sleep without regret, that we speak what's true, that we don't act in ways that harm other people um, through our words and our deeds. And this is a kind of happiness that no one can take from you, no matter what happens in the world. Um, this happiness of your being true to yourself and speaking with honesty and acting in ways that do not harm um, becomes a beautiful happiness. And it, again, the Buddha says it's like the perfume that's, that, that rises beyond rose bay and jasmine. It's the perfume of, of those, that goodness that rises to the gods, to the, to the whole world. And then there's the happiness of the mind and heart, of quieting the mind and tending the heart. And again, one of the verses says, who is your enemy? Mind is your enemy. No one can harm you more than your own mind, untrained. And we all know this, you know, that our own mind through our fears and confusions and grasping and so forth can create tremendous trouble and suffering for us. And then the Buddha goes on, who is your friend? Mind is your friend. No one can help you more than your own mind and heart trained well. Um, not even the most loving grandfather will say, of our, not even the most loving parents, than your own heart, heart and mind. And to be able to make through your own meditation and attention to bring the mind and heart to a place of peace and well-being in yourself that's a deep deep happiness that can't be taken from you and you'll see it in your lives you know you'll have people who like you and don't like you praise and blame will happen it happens to everybody and gain and loss you will have you know joy and sorrow will come but these aren't the deeper happiness the deeper happiness comes from, from the heart itself. And I've been in refugee camps where the poorest people in the world had so much dignity and love and care for one another that their, their goodness outshone, you know, the, 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 the wealthiest and most royal people you could imagine, their goodness shone from their hearts. And this is really what happiness is about. It's not putting down the other but saying, yeah, that's, that's there, but it, does, it won't satisfy the heart. And this is what makes us truly wise. Thank you, doctor, for your valuable words. And like Buddha said, health is the greatest gift, contentment is the greatest wealth, and faithfulness is the best relationship. And I feel like that quote can really relate to the answer you gave us. Um, and also, the next question we have for you, doctor, is that, Today, we are witnessing so much of a polarization at the community, international, and national levels. And from a young age, we are bombarded with the information that propagates attachment to our egocentric way of thinking. Me, I, mine, my family, my country, my village. And however, like the COVID-19 virus is communicating a very powerful message of interdependent and interconnected nature of all phenomena and the illusion of this egocentric consciousness. Could you kindly teach us as children of today and as future adults, what skills we need to nurture in order to experience contentment and to learn the art of letting go our desires, selfish ideologies, attitudes and behaviors? How do we cultivate an expansive universal consciousness that in, embraces all living beings, including the plant and animal world? Your questions are deep ones and, and beautiful ones. And the response I wanna give is maybe a little different than you expect, because one way we could turn and say, all right, I, me, mine, clinging, feeling separate from the others. 
is causing a lot of the problems of the world. The, the, the false belief somehow that if I'm, if I can take care of this and hold on and get more, then I'll be all right. But the pandemic, as you said, shows that it doesn't matter who you are, or what you have, we're all interconnected. Um, but rather than look at it through the lens of that clinging to self, I want to talk about love because I see this as in some way the, the remedy or the antidote or the, the, the gate really to a, a different way of being. Um, one of my teachers who was like Dr. Ari, who was one of the kind of remarkable figures in the Buddhist world and who is a friend of Dr. Ari's is a man named Mahagosananda. Mahagosananda was the kind of the Gandhi figure of Cambodia. And he and I lived in forest monasteries together um, back in the late, the, the end of the 1960s, early 70s. When the Khmer Rouge came into power, and you know this because you've seen the war in Sri Lanka, and you know how terrible civil war can be. Um, he was out of the country. We were in Thailand when his village was burned and all the members of his family were killed, his extended family, and the temple was destroyed. And something like 2 million of the 8 or 10 million people of Cambodia were killed by the Khmer Rouge. So it was a, it was a terrible civil war and a terrible time. And many, many refugees fled uh, to the refugee camps run by the UN on the border in Thailand to be safe, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And he said, we need to go to these camps. So I went with him. And after a little time, he got permission from the United Nations to build a little Buddhist temple, which was basically a big platform with an altar in it in the middle of the camp. And here's a camp of 50 or 100,000 refugees, all in tiny little huts. And he said, we need a temple for these people. And on the day that the temple was to open, um, we heard that the Khmer Rouge underground in the camp, they had told people that if anyone went to that temple, when they got out of the camp, they would be killed. Um, so this was a very dangerous thing. Um, and we went through the camp ringing a big gong to invite people to come for the opening. And 25,000 people poured into the central square of this camp. And here was, here was um, Gosananda seated with his hands together after they all gathered and he rang the bell. And he began to chant in Pali. Uh, and in Khmer and Cambodian, um, one of the first verses of the Dhammapada, he looked out, I thought, what can you say? Because here were people who ha had lost half their family, their father or mother or children were stolen or killed, their, their, their land was, you know, their homes were burned. And you could see all of the trauma uh, one grandmother with only a few of her grandchildren left. What can you say to people? And so I sat and you know, over and over again. And, and these were people who hadn't heard these chants in some years because the temples were burned. And gradually the whole crowd started to chant with him as they wept. Hatred never ends by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. And then Gosananda, who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize many times, began these Dharma, yat, Dharma Yatras or peace walks. And he would say, when the Khmer Rouge had been somewhat defeated, he said, you can go back to your villages, but not in the back of a van or a truck or a bus. He said, you have to reclaim your land with your metta. And so in long lines of a hundred 
or 200 or 1,000 people, they would walk on foot, ringing a bell, hitting a drum, and chanting, hatred never ends by hatred, but by love alone is healed, one step at a time. He said, in this way, you will walk through what were the killing fields and reclaim your land and turn it into a land of love. You will go back to your villages, not in the spirit of hatred, but in the spirit of connection to one another. And he did it again and again, leading people like Dr. Ari has done from a place of love. And in some way, when I think about your deep question, you know, and how do we step out of I, me, and mine, part of the, the language and the understanding I want to turn to is the language of the heart. And you know, in India, there's a saying, um, a description of an experience of meeting a, a great teacher, whoever she might be, or he might be someone you admire, some wonderful sage, um, that's called the, the glance of mercy. And what it means is that it, it, in a moment, you can be with a, a wise person, a wise, great wise grandmother or, or master, and have them look at you and see the secret beauty that you are, that gift of Buddha nature, whatever language you want to use that's born into you, to look at you with so much love, not wanting anything, not needing you to be any different. There you are, you know, with your own unique body and personality and thoughts, you're a human being. And to see you with that much love, that it rewires your whole being, that somehow when you're seen that way, you realize something that it's possible to look at the world with eyes of love. And I think that's part of what made Ari effective. Yes, he's the most, I think the most skilled community organizer on the planet. You know, he's a visionary in all these ways, but it's not that that did it. I mean, that, that's a genius that he has, and he is that. But it's really his love that people could feel that. And he said, that's really what he wanted to teach was people to feed each other and love each other. And so when you ask about how do you step out of I and me and mine, it's not that I and me and mine is so terrible. It's just really impoverished. It's like you don't have anything good to eat. And what you really need as a response in some way um, to that is the cultivation of metta and loving kindness um, and remembering that that's what we're here for, to love one another, and to love this mysterious, amazing world that we're in with all the beings around us. Uh, and that I feel is in some way what, um, what the world needs as much as anything. Thank, thank you so much, Doctor. I think that was a really um, a nice approach that you brought into the question. And I think it's more relatable for us today, like to go out there and sort of love people genuinely and put all our differences aside. And it's much needed. It's a much needed message in today's world. Um, so the final question we have for you today, Doctor, is that in today's day and age, we humans, we chase our unlimited desires and are hardly ever content with what we get. And in the process of chasing our desires, we become disconnected from ourselves and the world around us. And thinking about the planet as a whole, what effects will this have on us during the present as well as the future? Well, I, I will do my best to answer it. But then I am going to turn it back to you because I also want to know what you two have discovered. You know, it's going to be important to hear that. Sometimes I have been asked to perform wedding ceremonies. I don't do it so much anymore, but I will on occasion. But I have in the past. Um, and if you two end up getting married, you know, you'll have your own wedding ceremonies. I think they're smiling, so it could happen someday. Um, and it's joyful, it's beautiful. And I say, when before it, I say, you know, 
this is a really special day because on this day, you get to be the princess, the queen. This is a day for you to show your beauty and glory and love and all that you care about to the world and to be celebrated, you and whoever you marry. So it's just something very special about it. But I also know that when people get married, um, it's not always easy. Sometimes it's easy, but because we're human beings, we also have different ideas and desires. And so we get in conflict with one another at times. Um, and that can rub us in the wrong way or even be very difficult. And one of the things that I do in a marriage ceremony, um, so I talk about the, the Dharma or the Dhamma and the, the principles uh, of it. I say, um, this is a very mundane and pedestrian, you have to give me image, but in the United States, if you go to buy a used car, a used automobile, right? Not a new one. And you go to the car lot and you're looking at these cars that are a few years old and you're gonna buy one. They have a sign in the window of the car that says, as is. And what that sign means is you agree to buy this car. And if the brakes don't work so well or the seats are a little dirty or something, you look at it and you say, I want it anyway. And you can't go and complain afterward because you chose it in some way. And then I look at this couple and I say, do you take this person as is? not hoping they'll be better or that you can fix them or they'll do something for you or some bargain or some exchange, some sort of business partnership. But this is really about love. Do you accept them and take them as is? And as is doesn't mean they won't change and grow because the real love is not about attachment to a person, but it's loving them so much that you help uplift, that you help them become the most beautiful person they can. And so I say, do you take this person as is? And they say, yes. I said, that's a really good way. You need to remember this because later on, you might think, well, I wish they would change a little bit that way and do that differently. But if you actually can be with somebody and accept them in that fashion, uh, it starts to transform everything. And that becomes in some deeper way, you know, the, the relationship that you begin to have with the world around you also. Um, nati santi parang sukang. Um, there's no higher happiness than peace, uh, says the Buddha. And that peace comes from not being in an argument with the way the world is. It doesn't mean you can't change it and plant beautiful seeds and water the things that matter. I love the, the response of Zen master Suzuki Roshi, who was a great Zen master who came to the US in the 1950s and 60s. And he was looking at his students with a great deal of love one day and he said, you're perfect just the way you are. Right? So that's a beautiful thing to hear from your teacher, you know, to feel that there's some beauty and perfection. You're perfect just the way you are. And then he paused for a little bit and he said, and there's still room for improvement, you know, and what that what he meant is that you can love the world in some way that accepts the way that it is. Um, and at the same time, you can also work to plant beautiful seeds and make a difference. And this, I think, is partly what um, makes for a peaceful heart. Um, I mean, here we are in the pandemic and the Buddha again said, sickness, aging, death, uh, loss of things that you care about, or he said, you, there's gain and loss, there's praise and blame, there's pleasure and pain, there's birth and death. Did you think these would not happen to you? Now, there's a really deep remark. Did you think these would not happen to you? They will, and they do. And then the Buddha, in his way, looked out with wisdom and the great heart and said, in the midst of all this, 
you can have a peaceful heart. You can have a peaceful heart, not by clinging to the way you think things should be, but by receiving them with clarity and compassion. This is the suffering. This is the beauty of it. And keeping your own heart as a place of peace in the middle of it. And that requires a lot of letting go. My teacher, Ajahn Shah, said, if you let go a little bit, you'll have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. And if you really let go, you'll be at ease wherever you are. And the thing is, people get confused and they think let go, letting go means not caring. But that's kind of the near enemy of uh, letting go. It doesn't mean that at all. It means letting go of your clinging and your grasping about how it's supposed to be and saying, this is the way it is. And now seeing it truly with its joys and its sorrows, seeing the pandemic, seeing the climate change that we have to pay attention to and make a difference about. And your generation has so much at stake in this and you can feel it in your bodies. It's like, you know of, about the planet and you can feel it. So you have to see it with truth, but at the same time, you don't want to add to it with your own fear and confusion and anger, because those are the very things that tear people apart that make the problem of climate change. Instead, you make your heart a place of peace. You let go and say, all right, this is how it is. Now, let me take this garden with its difficulty and weeds and problems and plant something in it that for the generations ahead, that's beautiful and I will water and I will, I will make, make a difference. But you do it from a peaceful heart. So now it's my turn to ask you, what have you learned? How would you answer that beautiful question? Um, I think on like a personal level, I think we sort of, before the pandemic, I think we were going around, you know, very busy with our daily work and like, you barely had enough time to sort of stay at home and sort of connect with the real world. And I think when we go on, you know, chasing our desires, we often sort of forget about ourselves and we forget about the world around us. So actually staying at home for me really helped me sort of collect my thoughts and really understand the fact that, you know, you, we can't actually go out there and change the entire world but we can start to create change in the little communities we're from and start to accept things the way it is and sort of try and do everything in our lives to sort of make it a better place for the future generation. And so that's something I sort of live by. How does that work when you have that spirit? How does that affect you does, when you have that standing? it makes me sort of happy. And I think end of the day that I know what uh, like material stuff sort of bring you temporary happiness, but the contentment and the happiness you get in that perspective, in the perspective of, you know, sort of understanding the world as it is, like you said, it's sort of a greater happiness and that's uh, could carry on for like far more time. Beautiful, beautiful. How about you, uh, Sonara? Um, I would like to start off with a quote from the Buddha. He, he said, you only lose what you cling to. And what I learned is that the reason for all our oceans to be polluted, all these forests to be cut down, they all start with our needs, uh, with our desires, our want for more. And all those attachments we had with materialistic things, that's what end up, ends up in the ocean. That's why we see wildfires, global warming, and the thing is, we never really thought about this until it happened. But now that it's happening, we, we were like, okay, great. Now what? Now what do we do? In, but I feel like if instead of thinking and, you know, just con constantly worrying about what you can do, do what you must. And that is just take baby steps. And from a young age, I feel like children should be taught about, you know, the importance of letting go and accepting the world as it is. Be happy with what you have. It's because we seek for more. That's why our you know, habitat, habitats are being destroyed. Oceans are being polluted. 
But, but well, I feel like the change has to be made within yourself. You start with yourself and then you share it with others and then the rest of the world. Uh, and I feel like our needs are what we need. We can get them. We don't have to destroy habitats or pollute oceans. Whereas our wants, they drive us to, even subconsciously, we don't know. We take a plastic, you know, a drink in a plastic cup, but that's to fulfill our desire. But what happens after we fulfilled our desire? That bottle goes into the ocean or to the forest. And that would remain there for a very long time, even though that temporary need, want had been covered up. And I feel like if we can concentrate on what we have and work towards what we can make better in the world, accepting every human being, every animal, every aspect of nature as it is, we can really change the world, even in a small way. But for that, we need to start from ourselves. We need to control our desires. And we need to say, is this necessary? You know, whatever we be taking, is this necessary? And although this would have a short-term effect on ourselves, our planet would have to pay the price. And yeah, I feel like we have to stop seeking for more and accepting what we have before us. I wish the two of you could run for president of Sri Lanka <laughs> or the US, that would be fine with me too. It's just beautiful to listen to you both um, because you've obviously really reflected and, and, and looked into this and you have the kind of voices like Greta, I must say, who's one of your peers, maybe a little bit older, but not that much, that's willing to tell the truth. Um, what that the world needs at this time and to say we have to we have to see this clearly with you know with mindfulness and compassion and then let us let that what we see clearly change who we are and how we act it's beautiful to hear you so I I thank you for this ah. thank you so much doctor for your valuable words we definitely learned so much on the topic and now we would kindly um, ask you to guide us through a meditation to sort of collect our minds and our souls and to spread that love and compassion to everyone out there who's going through tough times. Uh, maybe we could remember them through this meditation. I'll be happy to do this. So let's take maybe five minutes or so for uh, those who are part of this. Um, and this becomes really important even before we start to make your heart a zone of peace. And even before we start to re remember and think of those you know, think of someone who has a peaceful and loving heart, who you like to be around, who touches you. You know, what is it like to be with people who are loving and peaceful? And you can remember who they are, what that feels like, and then begin to realize, oh yeah, this is possible. This is possible for me too. So let your eyes close gently. And first, as you quiet, take two or three deeper breaths. And as you do, let the mind quiet and release what tension you can from the body. And then take a moment of gratitude as you feel all that your body and heart have been carrying through this pandemic, it's a lot. So much going on and so many ways that have touched you and restricted your lives. And you carry all this naturally. And almost as if you could make a bow 
and say your heart and your body, thank you. Thank you for caring so much. Thank you for trying to keep me safe. All the thoughts and feelings, everything in your body. Thank you, I'm okay just now, in this moment. Thank you, I'm okay. You can rest. You can let go and let the body relax and the heart be easy and the mind quiet. And now think of someone who you love, where there's love and care, where it's not conflicted but easy where the Buddha's instructions are to start with metta wherever it's easiest, whatever most naturally opens your heart. And as you picture or visualize this loved one, this person you care about, begin the simple well-wishing. May you be safe and protected. Feel the wish for them to be safe and protected. May you be well and strong or healed if it's needed, well and strong. May your difficulties be held in tender compassion. And may your heart be filled with metta, with loving kindness and peace. And sense how beautiful it is to wish well for this person you care about. And then sensing how the heart opens so naturally in this way. Let the quality of metta or loving kindness fill not just your heart, but your whole body and being. So you too feel safe and protected. Well and strong. So your troubles are held in a tender compassion. And your heart is filled with metta and peace. And finally, imagine that you can be like a lighthouse or a beacon that from this peaceful and loving heart, you can send the wishes and energy of metta and peace out to all those around you in every direction, to your loved ones and family, to your friends and community, And let your metta shine now beyond to the whole of Sri Lanka and all who live there. And out across the world, in every direction, beings, not just humans, 
but all living beings, all creatures, young and old, May all feel the loving kindness that's possible. May all be safe and protected. May all be well and healed. May the struggles of beings everywhere be held in tender compassion. And may the hearts of beings be filled with loving kindness and peace. and sense that you can move through this world as we meditate with our eyes closed and now you can open them gently. You can see with the eyes of love and tender compassion and courage, all the beings, this great and marvelous earth. And as you said so beautifully, you can start in small ways and plant seeds and tend what you can and turn the difficulties of the world into a place that's so much more beautiful because your own heart filled with metta and peace is underneath everything you do. So I want to thank you also. It's really a privilege and, and a terribly sweet and wonderful thing to speak with such wise young women as you are. And look, there's Ari. Oh, oh, oh God, it's wonderful. Oh, Ari, I love you. So happy to see you. And look, look at who the new generation of, of Tidama teachers are. It's fantastic. Now my work is being done by the new generation. They are continuing. They're yeah. they're so they're so beautiful and so wise already. Yes. <laughs> Very special. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Today we learned a lot from you, and uh, definitely your words of advice you gave us and the message uh, messages you gave us to today's session would definitely help so many people out there uh, come into contentment with these tough times and accept things the way it is. So we're humbled and honored to have got to know you today. And now I would like to invite Dr. Charika to share some closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tiara. Um, wow, what a rich uh, intergenerational uh, dialogue. I think Dr. Confield uh, uh, beautifully uh, captured the spirit of this intergenerational dialogue. To quote you, if I may, uh, lamp of awakening being carried from one generation to another. I think this is exactly the spirit behind this uh, entire exercise. It's a Quite a challenge to do online uh, organized pro online uh, programs of this nature, uh, especially in a country like Sri Lanka with so many natural and other disasters and uh, resource uh, constraints. So thank you very much uh, uh, for accepting our humble inv invitation. And I would like to express uh, our sincere gratitude to you on behalf of all the trustees of Vishwaniketan, the many uh, the uh, trustees of the ATRI Ratna Charitable Trust, uh, what a blessing, uh, what an auspicious event this is, and uh, on an auspicious day like Vesak, and also I would like to extend extend my sincere.
thanks to Sanara and uh, Tiara. I mean, you got some excellent feedback and uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think I can express in uh, words are not enough to express uh, how proud I am, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, hear such uh, uh, comments and uh, comments uh, from uh, uh, a person of that caliber. Uh, so thank you so much, Tiara and Sanara, uh, for sharing your own wisdom on the subject of containment and letting go. And also, I would like to uh, extend my sincere gratitude to uh, Brother Krishna for uh, organizing uh, this uh, uh, gathering and also Madhushan, Niven, and uh, uh, for facilitating the process. And of course, uh, for Dr. Ari for being here with us uh, uh, at least for a few minutes. Uh, as an expression of gratitude to Dr. Jack Confield. I sincerely hope that this is the beginning of a series of dialogue with you. Uh, we, uh, recently, I participated in the, uh, 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 the summit on uh, uh, science and wisdom of emotions. And uh, there was a lot of talk about intergenerational trauma. And uh, Professor Richard Davidson beautifully uh, said that, you know, shared his thoughts on that phrase and said, we need to uh, study on intergenerational awakening. So what we have witnessed today uh, is intergenerational awakening, not intergenerational trauma. So thank you so much for your beautiful presence and wisdom. Uh, as you mentioned, um, Mahagot, uh, about, you know, uh, shared your uh, ex uh, interaction with Mahagoshananda Tero and Tignatan. Uh, I mean, Mahagoshananda Tero visited Vishwaniketan before, uh, uh, before he passed away. And we have some very uh, beautiful memories of Mahagoshananda Tero visiting Vishwaniketan. And also we invited Tignatan Tera uh, uh, to be the chief guest at the opening of Vishwaniketan Peace Center in 1999. But unfortunately for practical reasons, he's, he was unable to come, but he sent his uh, you know, blessings and wishes to us. So with these concluding remarks, uh, I would like to close uh, this session. May all... Uh, beings be well, happy, and peaceful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.